Hello everyone, today we'll be talking about non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. There are a lot of mnemonics for non-anion gap acidosis and you can see that they are everywhere. Once you understand the concept behind non-anion gap acidosis, you should be able to generate your own differentials in a much more organized way. In the previous lecture, we talked about anion gap. Go ahead and review that, but anion gap was defined as sodium minus chloride plus bicarb. Non-anion gap metabolic acidosis is also called normal anion gap acidosis or hyperchloremic acidosis. If you look at this figure closely, you'll figure out that to keep your anion gap same and have acidosis, your bicarb and chloride must be exchanging amongst themselves. So in non-anion gap acidosis, your bicarb and chloride always exchange in one-to-one -one ratio. So there can be only two reasons for non-anion gap acidosis. First is loss of bicarb. And when you lose bicarb, chloride will come and take its place. So if you lose one milliequivalent of bicarb, you generate one milliequivalent of chloride. The other region will be getting too much chloride. And in this case, you will lose bicarb by same amount in one to one ratio. So there are only three organs that deal with significant amount of bicarb, your kidneys, gut, and hepatobiliary tree. And that's where most of the differentials comes from. The other thing that can cause metabolic acidosis is getting acid from external source and the commonest among them is normal saline. Other sources of acid include toluene toxicity as seen in glue sniffing and ingestion of ammonium chloride. Amino acids like lysine and arginine are metabolized into acids and that can cause non anion gap acidosis if taken in large amounts. A better way to divide non anion gap acidosis is to divide between renal and extrarenal causes. The extrarenal can be divided into GI losses and extra acids. Of these, kidneys are the only one who have responsibility to maintain your pH. GI losses can happen from colon, though secretion of bicarb in colon is pretty limited in normal situation. The majority of bicarb actually comes from hepatobiliary tree and pancreas. And the role of this bicarb is to neutralize the acid and make the food more alkaline for enzymes to act on. Most of this bicarb is absorbed in small intestines. However, if there are a problem with secretory diarrhea, there is an increased motility in small intestine and most of the bicarb is lost in the stool. And you can see that the amount of bicarb in secretory diarrhea is much higher. In inflammatory diarrhea, there is increased secretion of bicarb in colon, but this does not amount to a lot of bicarb. In an ileostomy, you can lose quite a lot of bicarb depending upon the site of ileostomy. And you, you can see that the bicarb concentration in ileostomy fluid is decently high. In patients with urinary diversion, your ureters are attached to either ileal or jejunal chondroit, and when the urine is in contact with the bowel wall, it tries to perform its function and can reabsorb hydrogen and chloride and the amount of absorption will depend upon the length of segment and where it is taken from. Normal saline is the commonest cause of non anion gap acidosis in hospitalized patients and you can see that it contains quite a lot of chloride at 154 millimoles per liter while your plasma concentration is only 105. The pH of normal saline solution is not neutral but is acidic in nature. pH runs around 5.5. Toluene toxicity is seen in glue sniffing. It is present in solvent like paint, lacquers, thinners and adhesives. And it presents with non anion gap acidosis with hypokalemia and causes severe muscle weakness. It also causes a lot of neurosymptom due to its high lipid solubility. Toluene causes distal RTA type 1 in which there is inability to excrete hydrogen ions and there is reduced ammonia production. Since renal tubular acidosis is a complicated topic, this would require a totally separate lecture. So please watch my lecture on how kidneys handle acid and renal tubular acidosis to understand further. There is not much I could find on the YouTube which describes it in an easy fashion. I've tried to simplify the best I can, see if you like it. But in a nutshell, there are three things that your kidneys do to handle acid. First, it reabsorbs all the bicarb that is filtered in your glomeruli. It increases your ammonia production for acidosis and also helps excrete tractor double acid. So step one in evaluating a non anion gap acidosis is get a good history. You will know the etiology most of the time. If you look at your medication list, ask history about GI surgery and GI losses, look for normal saline use, look for ingestion, etc. 
So as we talked about, kidneys use ammonia to get rid of hydrogen ions. And this ammonia comes from the amino acid glutamine. Ammonia is excreted in urine where it combines with hydrogen ion and is excreted as ammonium ion. Acidosis and hypokalemia stimulate this pathway. So if you look at urine, there are positive and negative ions just like your serum. In the positive compartment, you've got sodium, potassium and ammonium. And in negative, you have chloride, phosphate and other organic anions. So you can calculate a urine ion gap, which is sodium plus potassium minus chloride. And this will give you the amount of ammonia production. However, the sign is negative because amount of sodium and potassium is much lower than chloride because of huge amount of ammonium present in the urine. Since sodium plus potassium is lower than chloride, the urine ion gap is normally negative with range from minus 20 to minus 50. One of the assumptions that we are taking in this case is that difference is the amount of ammonia and the negative ion that is excreted with ammonia is chloride. So if you have worsening acidosis, your body is going to rev up ammonia excretion and that will be excreted in the urine because you are trying to get rid of those hydrogen ions. And therefore, your urine anion gap is going to become more negative. So that would mean that your kidneys are doing what they are needing to do. So kidneys are not the cause of acidosis. So if you have got urine anion gap between minus 30 to minus 50, that means you have great ammonia production by the kidneys and the cause for acidosis is extra renal. If you have low amount of ammonia production your urine anion gap will become more positive and that would mean that the kidneys are not rising up to the occasion and are the cause of acidosis. So urine anion gap more than zero means there is a defect in ammonium production and this is usually seen in renal causes like CKD, ESRD, kidney injury, etc. This is a little bit counterintuitive because of the negative sign but you have to remember this fact. If your urine anion gap is minus 30 to minus 50, that means good ammonia production. That means your kidneys are good. And if it is more than zero, that means there's a defect in ammonia production and you have bad kidneys. And this is a commonly asked question in your board. So remember this very well. So let's understand a little bit about the limitation of this test. In patients with polyuria, you can already see that you'll be making more dilute urine. So the difference between sodium, potassium and chloride will decrease because of diluted urine. The other important constraint of this test is if your sodium is less than 20, if you have reduced sodium to the distal convoluted tubule, it reduces your hydrogen excretion. So all the ammonia that your body is producing is reabsorbed into the circulation and doesn't attach it to hydrogen ion. Therefore, it would appear that your ammonium production is reduced and you're thinking about renal causes while your kidneys are doing their job properly. Low urine sodium is pretty common as it's seen in pre-renal state. So in patients who are volume depleted, giving them sodium by any form, for example as bicarb or chloride, will help improve acidosis. Other problem is presence of organic anions. For example, if you look at this figure on the right, you would expect that there are renal causes because your urine anion gap is positive. However, if you look more closely, there are other acids which are present in the urine like keto acids, acetyl salicylic, D-lactic, heparic, penicillin. These can reduce the amount of chloride in the urine and can falsely elevate your urine ion gap. So there are a lot of limitations to your urine ion gap. So it's better to use another term called urine osmolal gap. And you can calculate your urine osmolality by multiplying sodium plus potassium by 2, add glucose by 18 and BUN by 28 as we did in our serum osmolality calculation. And you can find urine osmolal gap by subtracting this from measured urine osmolality. So this will be your urine osmolal gap. And this would represent amount of ammonia in urine. And you don't have to worry about the negative charge because it can be any other chloride, phosphate or organic acid. 50% of this urine osmolal gap would be from ammonia. So if you've got increased ammonium production, you have increased urine osmolal gap. If your urine osmolal gap is more than 150, that means your kidneys are doing a great job and there are extra renal cause for non-nine gap acidosis. If your urine osmolal gap is less than 50, that would mean your kidneys are not doing a good job and you have renal causes for non-nine gap acidosis. The limitation of urine osmolal gap includes high glucose in urine that can throw off your calculation or presence of unmeasured osmotic molecules like alcohol, mannitol, etc. 
common limitation to both the methods will be presence of urea splitting organisms like proteus which can make ammonia from the urea and therefore increase its concentration and make your urine and gap look normal. In cases of allyl conduits, the portion of allium can absorb ammonia and falsely reduce the ammonium ions. Other lab that you can see to help you will be serum potassium. You can see low potassium in patient with GI losses and renal losses like RTA type 1 and 2. Patients with CKD, AKI or ESRD, you won't be able to excrete out potassium, so you will see hyperkalemia. Medications like trimethoprim, spironolactone, ACE inhibitor can also cause high potassium. Patients with RTA type 4, which is a low aldosterone state, will also present as hyperkalemia. Patients with volume loss have revved up aldosterone stimulation and that can make your potassium loss even worse as your body is trying to retain on the sodium and losing potassium. Other thing that you can look at is urine pH. If your kidneys are functioning normally in acidosis, you should be making acidic urine. That means your urine pH should be less than 5.3 and that would mean that there are extraordinary causes for non nan gap acidosis. RTA type 4 is the exceptional RTA which results in more acidic urine production. If your urine is not appropriately acidic, that means your urine pH is more than 5.3. That means your kidneys are not handling your acid properly and it can be seen in CKD and RTA type 1 and 2. Hypokalemia stimulates ammonia production. So sometimes your urine pH can rise in patient with volume depletion. So patient with GI losses can sometimes present with high urine pH. In summary, whenever you have non nan gap acidosis, always get a good history because that will direct you to the commonest etiology that are affecting your patient. This is how you work up a non nan gap acidosis. Step one is to look at your urine osmolal gap or urine anion gap. And if your urine osmolal gap is less than 50 or urine anion gap is more than zero, that means low ammonia production, that means there are renal causes, and you're looking at CKD, ESRD, AKI type 1 RTA, for example, as seen in medications like amphotericin B, type 4 RTA, which is the commonest type of RTA seen in diabetic or hypertensive nephropathy, patients on spironolactone, ACE inhibitor, etc. If you got urine osmolal gap more than 150 or urine anion gap between minus 30 to minus 50, that means you have got good ammonia production. That means there are exogenous causes like GI losses or extra acid. Type 2 RTA is one of the exceptions which results in higher osmolal gap and good ammonia production. And these are seen in patient taking carbonic anhydrase inhibitor or cisplatin. GI losses include diarrhea, high ileostomy output, pancreatic or biliary drain, or ureter diversion. Commonest cause for non nine gap acidosis is normal saline. You can also look at potassium that can help you further diagnose some of the things. However, the utility is a little bit limited. Patients with GI losses and type 1 and type 2 RTA usually have lower potassium as compared to patient with CKD, ESRD, AKI or type 4 RTA in which the potassium is higher. Looking at all the etiologies and the workup, you can make your own mnemonic to help you further. These are the references. Thank you.